Welcome to a special 15-year anniversary episode of Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. This afternoon, it's my pleasure to welcome Shupreti Guha, Director of the Nanoscience and Technology Division in the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne National Laboratory. He also serves as a professor at the Institute for Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. Prior to taking these positions, he spent 20 years at IBM, where he pioneered research that led to IBM's high dielectric constant metal gate transistor. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. To get things started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got involved in nanotechnology? I'm a material scientist, mostly trained as an engineer. I grew up in India and studied metallurgical engineering there before coming to this country about 34 years back to do my PhD in essentially what we would call today semiconductor nanotechnology. I had wanted to go into semiconductors and I connected with uh, a professor at the University of Southern California called Anupam Madhukar, who was essentially doing research on nanotechnology, looking at how can we make smaller materials and devices controllably. And I did my PhD with him. And after that, in the early 90s, I moved on to IBM research, where I had the good fortune of working as a young man in a department that had some of the giants in the field of nanosciences. My bosses, Leo Isaki and Leroy Chang, for sure. And then there were other people in the department, such as Landauer, Fowler, Tursov, uh, Praveen Chaudhary. I worked in semiconductor nanotechnology from then on. And over time, I ended up with a career where I balanced both management duties as well as my research. So it sounds like a great opportunity that you had right out of school to work with some of the pioneers that you mentioned. But now you are at the Center for Nanoscale Materials. And when we look at the NNI, the user facilities are a really important part of the ecosystem. Your particular center follows three scientific themes, quantum materials and sensing, manipulating nanoscale interactions, and nanoscale dynamics. Can you Discuss a little bit from your perspective what projects you're most excited about. Yes, I am happy to. The quantum materials and sensing theme explores one of the most exciting areas of research that is emerging right now. And it's an area that fuses physics, chemistry, material science, computer science, and electrical engineering. And it's called quantum information sciences. And it's a way of processing information using quantum bits instead of the classical bits that we are used to in conventional computing. And we anticipate that this can enable in future orders of magnitude faster computation for certain types of problems. It can also enable breakthroughs in secure communications, that's already happening, and being able to make sensors, exquisite sensors, with more sensitivity than what classical methods allow us. In the second theme, in the area of manipulating nanoscale interactions, where we talk about the forces of interactions, and they could be mechanical or electromagnetic, between atoms on length scales of, let's say, from sub-nanometer to hundreds to a thousand nanometers. This is a really interesting area that CNM, or Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne, is pioneering. And one of the projects that we're working on is the development of ultra-flat lenses that use a completely different approach of creating images. It takes a surface upon which we design structures that we call metasurfaces, just to make it sound complicated. And then we modulate that surface to influence the scattering of light coming onto it. And we're able to, in this fashion, build imaging systems that are very, very thin. And it gets rid of conventional lensing systems. And if you think of lenses that are like flat pancake-like, the width of a thin wafer, for instance, you can think of its many advantages. The third theme, which is nanoscale dynamics, is opening a window to the world of how materials behave when they are dynamically changing state or their structure on very fast time scales, and I am talking picoseconds to nanoseconds. 
and they're changing the state or their structure in response to light or mechanical stimuli or electrical stimuli. And we know very little of this window. We have a very small view through this window simply because the equipment that will allow us to carry out these studies at such small timescales and high spatial resolution did not exist till very recently. But this is changing. And here we are very excited that at the Center for Nanoscale Materials, we are getting an ultra-fast electron microscope that will allow us to probe materials and image them uh, at picosecond resolution and for certain kinds of imaging at nanometer spatial resolution. Uh, and this will be available to our users. This will be the first ultra-fast electron microscope capable of high-resolution spatial imaging and diffraction in the world that will be available as a user facility. So that's very exciting to have an instrument that can probe at that spatial resolution that quickly. So when you look at an instrument like the ultra-fast electron microscope you just described, can you discuss a little bit what types of measurements or experiments? Is that looking at, for instance, catalysis on a surface? There are many examples, and I'll try to give you a few different ones. So, for instance, if something hits a material really hard, let's say a bullet hits a material or a material gets hit by a shock wave, what happens to the material dynamically over scales of nanoseconds? We are not able to image that picture clearly today, but we should be able to, and we are increasingly being able to do so with ultra-fast electron microscopy. Or if we hit the material with light and it undergoes some sort of phase transformation, what is the path by which it undergoes those transformations? Are there ephemeral phases of materials that exist for brief moments of time that we don't know about? When we take an electrical device and we apply a voltage across it, let's say a transistor or a memory element, the device responds in a certain way. In a transistor, its drive current changes. In a memory element, you can write a state or you can read a state or you can erase a state. What happens to the microstructure, again, on picosecond to nanosecond timescales, as, let's say, a memory element goes through the process of changing its state? We really know very little about things on those ephemeral timescales. We've heard from a lot of small companies that the access to facilities is really vital to their success. Can you talk about how you are engaging with industry in your region? So I'll talk about the Center for Nanoscale Materials as a user facility of the Basic Energy Sciences Office of the Department of Energy. And it is one of five such facilities nationwide. And it's open to users from around the world. And we host some of the most sophisticated equipment in the nanosciences and world-class scientists. Now, we have industrial users. And we also have been increasingly setting up collaborations with industry in translating our science in the use of their technology. And the Department of Energy is also very interested in this. And there are special funds that you may be aware of called technology commercialization funds. We apply for these. People from a Department of Energy lab and members of industry apply jointly. Industry has to put in some investment and the Department of Energy puts in some investment as well. And we've had quite a few of these technology commercialization fund projects at the Center for Nanoscale Materials. And these have been recent projects, and they are doing really well in the area of nanoscale tribology, uh, developing nanomaterials, uh, using combinations of 2D materials and diamond nanoparticles to produce solid-state lubricants that achieve a condition of superlubricity or near-zero coefficient of friction. So that is work going on at CNM uh, with a couple of companies, big companies in the area of dry gas seal bearings or uh, automotive components and so on. Then we have interaction with a couple of Silicon Valley companies 
in things related to microelectromechanical systems. And we do a lot of the underlying science work there. I talked about the flat lenses. And we have a collaboration with large semiconductor equipment manufacturer in Silicon Valley in trying to develop this technology. Uh, so there is increasing interest in connecting to industry. I myself came from there, so I know this language. And this is just an example for the Center for Nanoscale Materials. Our sister uh, user facilities across the country have similar programs. One of the things we hear often about the NNI is that it really promoted this concept of interdisciplinarity and the fact that nanotechnology was really at the boundaries of traditional technical boundaries. What has your experience been, even as far back as when you were at IBM and now your experience at the university and the lab, in this concept of interdisciplinarity? And do you feel that things have changed over the past 15 years with respect to how people view that type of collaboration? Yes, multidisciplinarity is certainly something that we're seeing a lot more of over the past, I'd say, 15 to 20 years. And I do agree with you that the National Nanotechnology Initiative has played a strong role in fostering this multidisciplinarity between chemists, physicists, electrical engineers, biologists, and so on. I think the next move is in further increasing this multidisciplinarity onto the social sciences and to other areas of engineering as well. I, in particular, am interested in this nexus now between physical scientists and the social scientists. They are from very different worlds, but from what little I've been learning from my interactions on water sensing, I think there's a lot that can be done a lot of the work in social sciences can be informed by more data that we collect automatically from the land or from the water. Take a simple question, for example. How does water quality in a river affect fisheries and the economics of fisheries in a polluted area? This is a problem that will require this type of multidisciplinary approach. In terms of colleagues working in multidisciplinary areas, I think from what I've seen, that has improved and increased significantly. I have worked in industrial research, I've worked in national labs, and I have worked in universities now. I tend to think that industrial research today leads in their use of multidisciplinary research. This is followed by the national labs and then the universities. I want to look toward the future. Can you think of challenges that are likely to be impacted by nanotechnology? I can think of three major challenges going forward for the next 10, 15, 20 years. The first is in sensors, sensing a wide variety of things. You know, think of a central sensor network and you can screw sensors in and out like you would light bulbs. And this is where I feel nanotechnologies and the nanosciences can provide enormous impact combined with the advancements that are being made in low power electronics, in wireless radios, in system on a chip technology, in artificial intelligence. I think sensors are going to be big going forward. There's impact on environmental science, food security, public policy, health, and there are just so many other areas. And this business of the Internet of Things today is limited by the quality and availability of sensors, and this is where the nanosciences can come in. I think the second area is in the area of new materials and devices for information processing for the future. And this could be quantum information processing or classical computing as it is different from today's conventional architectures. And in the third area, which I am less familiar with, but I think is big, and there's work already happening here, is the application of nanotechnology to medicine. I want to thank you again for taking the time to talk with us today. And I, I want to offer you the opportunity. Do you have any closing thoughts that you would like to share with our listeners? I've been working in this field now for most of my career. 
across different materials, across different systems. And what I've personally gained from it is the ability to interact with and learn from a whole number of different specialists and experts, ranging all the way from public policy experts to electrical engineers. And I, I think nanosciences has sort of been the vehicle for me to be able to approach this multidisciplinarity. Thank you for joining us today for this special 15-year anniversary edition of Stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit nano.gov or email us at info at nnco.nano.gov and check back here for more stories. <laughs>